Okay, if I remember all of this correctly, we start out by discussing some of the um, theories of emotion. These quotes to me were the, uh, the best way to start talking about emotion since we spent about two and a half class periods at the beginning of the semester discussing what we think consciousness is, discussing other researchers and philosophers and people's definitions of consciousness and realizing that we don't we nobody agrees on on what this is there's no there's no definition where everybody's going to going to go in and say yes this is what consciousness is and if you know your psychology history you know that William James opened the first lab, psychology lab ever in America and um, he also has um, one of the he has the first book that came out for a kind of introductory psychology uh, textbook and he's quoted as saying, we know the meaning of consciousness as long as no one asks us to define it. Okay, and then I have, I have here quoted Joseph Ledoux, who is a pretty preeminent neuropsychologist currently, who works with young people who are handling um, neuropsychological problems, particularly if they are creating emotional issues for those people. So uh, he, he has a book talking about ADHD. Uh, and he is quoted as saying, unfortunately, one of the most significant things ever said about emotion may be that everyone knows what it is until they are asked to define it. So we're going to talk about another one of these really quite nebulous areas of psychology where we might not even agree what the definition is. So the very first thing we want to do in some manner, even though it's not going to make us all happy, is to distinguish between emotions and emotional behavior. There are two major components of emotion. So the physical component and the feeling component. The physical component, we might see a rapid heart rate. We might see someone start breathing harder. Uh, we might see some uh, galvanic skin response difference. Uh, we can measure physical measures of emotion. The other component, the feeling, whether they're feeling, someone is feeling scared or happy or excited or nervous, those are feelings and they are unobservable. So we are making some assumptions about people's feelings unless we're directly asking them. And, and to some extent, I'm going to continue to argue that even as we are interpreting our own um, physiological response and our own experience, we are interpreting to some extent our our own feelings and where that interpretation comes in is kind of the question i had here to the right the circumplex model uh, that's included where um, we see on the in the vertical we're um, talking about how aroused someone is are they neutral aroused or not aroused not aroused at the bottom and then from the left to right we're talking about uh, somebody's valence okay so just their kind of their mood is it negative neutral or positive moving from left to right and if you see so if i'm going to say that i am i like the difference one difference i like to see to talk about is nervous versus excited so i'm pretty aroused um and i could interpret that it could be i'm aroused because i'm nervous it could be that i'm aroused because i'm excited and really my interpretation of that arousal is going to be to some extent dependent on uh, not just what's happening with me, but partly on my mood, right? And my overall valence. And so if I'm not very happy about what I'm doing and, um, I, I, and I'm aroused, I might experience this as nervousness. But if I'm pretty happy about what I'm doing, and I'm using the word happy even though I don't like using that word necessarily because I want to say if I'm pretty excited about what I'm doing but I'm using the same word um, but if I'm pretty happy about what I'm doing or I have a pretty positive valence about what I'm doing and I'm pretty aroused I might interpret that as being excited um, about what I'm doing and so that's a really different interpretation of a very similar physiological response and it really depends on on my on valence if we go back if we go towards the um, down into some of the um, really feeling not aroused if i take the same again uh, the same levels here if i'm not very aroused 
and I'm in a pretty negative mood or negative valence, I might feel pretty depressed. But if I'm really not aroused and I'm in a pretty positive mood or valence, I might consider that or interpret that as being just feeling pretty serene, which is a pretty nice uh, feeling. So we're going to walk through a number of theories of uh, what's happening with this physiological component of emotion. And the common sense kind of way to think about this is, so I see something that's threatening like a grizzly bear. I feel a sense of fear. And so, and so I have my heart starts pounding. I'm trembling, sweating, and running away. What James Lange, I'm sorry, what William James and Carl Lange, so William James, the psychologist, and Carl Lange, um, a physiologist, back in the late 1800s suggested was actually our common sense of how the feeling of how this occurs is backwards that what we're doing instead is we're perceiving the stimulus this scary threatening grizzly bear we're having some autonomic nervous system arousal or the physiological response my heart's pounding my i'm trembling and sweating i'm running away and that is leading us to the emotion or the feeling of fear Another theory of how this works comes from Walter Cannon and Philip Bard, and they suggested that the mind and body are experiencing emotion independently and that this is happening simultaneously. So such that our autonomic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, the arousal is happening. That's occurring at the same time and simultaneously with how the, when the brain with the cortex is experiencing the experience of the emotion okay so i see the threatening grizzly bear and at the same time that happens my heart starts pounding i'm trembling sweating and running away at the same time simultaneously i'm feeling a sense of of fear and finally almost a hundred years later so more about around the 1960s Stanley Schachter and Jeremy Singer came up with their two-factor theory of emotion, where we're having a physiological response, and depending on the situation we are in, we're going to have a cognitive interpretation, or what we call an emotional label, and we then feel emotion. So just to distinguish the James Lange theory, we have a physiolo physiological response, and then we have some kind of interpretation of that response to feel the emotion. In this case, what they're adding is really this um, cognitive component and that we are labeling uh, the physiological response before having the actual emotion so we have an extra um, block in there of um, cognitive labeling so we have we see the grizzly bear or whatever threatening stimulus we have that physiological um, autonomic nervous system response and arousal we have the cognitive label that is one scary bear I'm afraid of it and then we feel the emotion of fear. This is really just a summary slide um, from a Psych 101 textbook that I first taught from. I, I find it really helpful to see things put together pictorially. So anytime I can uh, include something like that, I will. I will also just say here, so if you go back to the James Lange theory that um, William James did clarify his position at some point and said that there is a cognitive aspect, but he put that cognitive aspect at there's a stimulus, you have some kind of um, cognitive appraisal, is this good, is this bad, and then the autonomic nervous system, the autonomic arousal, the physiological response, and then the conscious feeling of fear. And you can see how that really differs from the Schachter Singer two factor theory, where they are putting so that autonomic nervous system arousal happening very quickly, that, that information is getting to those subcortical structures very quickly, and then you have some cognitive appraisal. And what I'm going to talk so if this helps you, great. If it doesn't, you can kind of move on, but I'm going to talk about this as. Um, Potentially, so some people want to throw out some of these cognitive or these um, theories of emotion, but I think it's good to think about when when our emotions are occurring 
in one way and when our emotions are occurring in a different way, and that sometimes our emotions might be explained by different theories. Walter Kamen was actually the first person to realize and put together that the sympathetic nervous system is um, a, a entire system preparing the body for brief, vigorous fight or flight kind of responses. He had this realization of, hey, you know, when my heart starts pounding and I also, I also start sweating and I also start breathing harder and taking in more oxygen and, and those feelings all come together and it appears to be preparing me for a potential fight or flight experience. But, um, and we saw, and, and your author here gives the picture again of our sympathetic nervous system where we have those that those cha the chain of ganglia and that they are those neurons are all um, kind of linked together and close together so that they can um, all be getting information at the same time in this fight or flight response but actually different situations can evoke a mixture of the sympathetic arousal and the parasympathetic arousal he gives us just one example of nausea so that's associated with sympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system and its stimulation of the stomach, but the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulating the intestines and the sweat glands in that case. So it's not necessarily, even though what we want to do in a fight or flight or, fight or flight situation is to be prepared to move quickly and react quickly. Um, we also have, we th these mechanisms can be working at the same time as the parasympathetic nervous system in different situations. Okay, and I put up a picture again of the circumplex model. Uh, in order to put this, some of this together, uh, we have this sub subjective experience, we have a physiological response, we have a cognitive appraisal. How is all of this working together? And the circumplex model shows again. Uh, we have the we have valence, uh, which is going to influence our subjective experience and our cognitive appraisal potentially, and we have a physiological response that is more clear of just aroused versus not aroused. We can measure it. These that is our emotional behavior that we can measure clearly. Okay, so I'm going to walk us through a number of pieces of evidence for and against the different theories. And so um, I'm going to try and make it clear when I'm talking what, what theory this is really evidence for and what theory this might be really evidence against. But sometimes I might not touch on both of those really clearly. So you might want to just get that uh, picture with the summary, uh, the summary picture, or write down really quickly your own kind of summary picture to think, to think through what is this evidence suggesting okay well one piece of evidence that really suggests that um, we need the autonomic nervous system experience in order to have uh, to feel an emotion and so maybe it is coming first so really a piece of evidence for the james lange theory potentially for so shock or singer as well but really for the james lane really clearly for the james lange theory um, is the people who have pure autonomic failure. So all the body systems are working just fine. I'm still, my my heart's beating, I'm breathing and everything's okay. Except what's happening is the output from the autonomic nervous system to the body is failing. So the sympathetic nervous system isn't having the, the influence that it usually does. What these people report is they have a reaction to stressful experiences. They report having the same emotions as anyone else and if you're telling them a story um, and they're hearing about a character they can tell how characters in the story must feel however when they state they, they're feeling emotions they're clearly feeling them much less intensely than before they they um, had the pure autonomic failure and they'll say things like of course i'm angry that's offensive to say Okay, I'm trying to do this. <laughs> so normally when we're angry, you can you can hear it in our voice. Of course I'm angry. That's offensive to say. But they, they'll they state their emotions and they'll say they're experiencing this emotion. But it's really without the intensity that we feel, um, that we tend to feel emotions. 
So I have a couple more pieces of evidence here um, suggesting that physiological arousal appears to be necessary for emotions, uh, which, which would um, support the James Lange theory. Uh, one, your author mentions the, that Botox, so the botulinum toxin, it uh, blocks acetylcholine um, at the neuromuscular junctions. And so they'll inject that into uh, the frown lines on the face so the person can't, is unable really to, to frown, right? Those muscles are, are um, temporarily paralyzed. And they report when watching short videos, they report less emotion in response to those videos. We also see if we give them something sad to read, they read more slowly in, in that if they had the Botox injection. Another piece of evidence is uh, the facial feedback hypothesis, which I have a picture of the, how they got this to kind of work uh, over to the right there. So a person would either hold a pen between their lips or sometimes between their nose and lips, uh, as you get that up between your, your nose and your lips, uh, or in, in your lips so that you're, whichever way you do it, you kind of have to make a, a little bit of a frown, but not really a strong frown. But the other way, so if you hold a pen uh, between your teeth, it, kind of, it really kind of forces you to, to smile. And then they had them read comics and um, the people who had the pen between their teeth so that they were smiling rated the comics as funnier. So this evidence all points to the notion that feeling a body change is important for experiencing the um, experiencing emotion. Now I have one more example, even though it's not evidence, it is, it is an example. Uh, but this, the idea is that, um, or what these people are trying to do is to induce uh, an aggressive warlike state by creating these particular emotions. And so I have a picture to the right of this particular tribe that um, originally, done, originally did this, some Aboriginal tribe, and then uh, in the middle is a, is a soccer team that is using the same the same kind of kind of war dance in order to induce emotions and induce a particular state within themselves and i do provide this link uh, underneath um, and i mean in blackboard so is physiological arousal sufficient for experiencing emotions do, is all we need is the physiological arousal well if our start heart starts racing and we're sweating and breathing rapidly and and um, breathing in a lot of oxygen, do we feel an emotion? It really depends on the situation, right? I mean, most of us have gone running or exercising at some point and we didn't feel like we were, ha we were having some kind of emotion because of that. So maybe not. Um, it really does appear to depend somewhat on interpretation. But if all of that occurs spontaneously, uh, so you're not exercising and you just start, your heart starts racing and you're sweating and breathing, heavily, um, you might interpret this increase of activity of the sympathetic nervous system as, as fear. And in fact, this is, it looks like what panic attacks are made of, uh, that the person is having all the, this physiological response, and then they're interpreting that as uh, being afraid, and that, and that continues on, it kind of spirals out as that response gets even stronger uh, and then they they start to feel like maybe I mean this gets to sometimes to the point of feeling like you're having a heart attack or something because you're panicking so badly partly just due to or really just due to this spontaneous autonomic nervous system activity so I'm going to include one more study that questions whether physiological arousal is sufficient for emotions. And this comes from Stanley Schachter, Jeremy Singer, and supports really the two-factor theory. This was their study done back in the 60s, where so uh, half the, so the participants are injected with epinephrine, so that's going to cause some autonomic nervous system response. Half of those participants are told this is a, a shot of epinephrine, and you're going to have, your heart's going to start racing, your hands are going to get clammy, you're going to get sweaty and start breathing hard. And the other half of the participants are uninformed about what this injection is all about. And then they split those people up uh, such that, that we have um, 
people in this euphoric condition, half of whom are informed, half of whom are who are uninformed. All right, all randomly assigned. The euphoric condition looks like this, where they are waiting, supposedly waiting for the experiment, and they are in there with a confederate who's also supposedly waiting for the experiment, and the confederate is just uh, throwing it paper airplanes and having a good time. Okay, and then the other half of the participants are in the angry condition, and again, half of them are informed, half of them are uninformed, all randomly assigned to these conditions, and the poor people who are uninformed in the angry condition, you can see this is the, this was the not good condition to be in, which sometimes happens to us in psychology experiments. Uh, so in this, in the angry condition, uh, they have them uh, sit down and answer questions that are sometimes offensive, like, how many men has your mom cheated on your father with you know so it's like these offensive questions and they're in there again with the confederate um and the confederate is behaving as if he's angry and uh gets up and balls up the paper and throws it in the trash can and slams the door so they're in they're in the angry condition and as you can see from the pictures what they what they found was in the euphoric condition we have the informed participants not really experiencing a lot of euphoria, although if we're looking at the figures down at the bottom, they're experiencing some euphoria, just not much. What, and what that says there, if I can read it okay, is, hmm, heart's pounding, hands are, clam hands are trembling, I guess that drug really works. The uninformed participants are just, if you can read that, just whoopee, they're just having a great time and they are experiencing uh, some euphoria. For the people in the angry condition, uh, the people who were informed, are again, if you look at the figure over to the right, the um, the data, they're not really feeling any of the um, behavioral symptoms of anger at all. And again, they are sitting there thinking, hmm, hearts pounding, hands clammy. I guess that drug really work. That drug really works. And these are just idealized what they're thinking. But obviously, they have an explanation, right, for this autonomic nervous system response. Whereas, again, the poor uninformed participant who's in the angry condition is experiencing um, behavioral anger. They are experiencing anger. So this suggests, right, that we have a physiological response and we have a potential emotion to this response. And that potential emotion to the response, first of all, is going to depend on the situation. Am I in a euphoric condition or it's in a place where I can be happy or I'm in it or I'm in Am I in an angry condition, a place where I might end up being uh, upset? And that's going to influence me. But also what influences me, right, is my cognitive appraisal. If I know that what I just had was an epinephrine shot and that, or that I'm going to have this autonomic nervous system response, then all I'm saying is, oh, the, that drug works, and that's why I'm having this response. And we can have some explanation for um, our physiological response, and it doesn't influence so much our emotions. All right, I wanted to keep this under 30 minutes and I'm getting really close. Uh, and I put up this summary slide one more time because one of the things I tend to just say here, and again, I want you to think through, what do I really think? What, how, how emotion works? Where is that autonomic nervous system response? And where is my conscious experience of emotion and feeling? And so one of the examples I sometimes use for this kind of we have so the information goes to the thalamus and that information is going to go um, to the rest of the brain and some of those regions of those subcortical regions of the brain are much more um, closely connected with the thalamus and that information has to go through more processing if you go back and think about how vision works how auditory how sound works that it's going through those um, primary receiving areas and then being sent for really cognitive appraisal right in the frontal lobes. So I give this example, again, just to think something through. This is an example and not evidence, but just something to think about how this happens to us sometimes. So if I, if I, if I see something curled up and winding around in my garage, I might think, hey, that's a snake, and I might become really afraid. I'm having this autonomic nervous res system response. And you can feel that, right? This kind of just whoop of your, of your, um, of your heart pounding and so forth. But a lot of times, so if, if I'm, if I'm, if I have a phobia of snakes, I'm going to run and freak out. But if 
I'm realizing I'm in my garage and I kind of think about it and I take a second look, I might notice, oh no, that's a hose that's all wound around itself. And so I very quickly have this whoop of my autonomic nervous system and then this, this very quick too, right, that's just come down. That's okay, that wasn't anything. And so the question is, I think, when does that cognitive appraisal occur? And does it always occur at the same time with the same timing? And I think it's a I think it's a very difficult thing to look at, and it's a it's a really it's a good question for us to ask ourselves.